Hello, and welcome to a very rare and special episode of Michael and Mom Talk Cancer. He is your official host, Michael Kramer, and I am his mom, Ashley. And today we're actually joining you, the two of us, but we are going to talk about, as Michael said, something rare. Something very rare. Something very rare. They even call it rare disease today. Yeah, so Rare Disease Day is February 29th of 2024, and our friends at Lumanity, they asked us if we would answer some questions on our podcast about rare diseases. So I think, what do you think, Michael? Are you ready? I think I was so ready. I think he was born ready for this. All I'm right. just the perfect rare person for this rare disease. You know? He is rare and he is beautiful. This is a serious day. It is a beautiful day. We're appreciative that there actually, this day does exist. Yes, rare disease day is amazing. We're very grateful it gets the recognition it does. It's very important for people like us. It is. In particular, since it is rare diseases, we know it doesn't affect so many of the population. But I think we should get right to it. All right. Michael Kramer, so we do have some questions from our friends at Lumanity, and the first thing they wanted to know, and I think I agree with this 100%, what did it mean to you to be diagnosed with a, quote, rare disease? And I just want to start this, well, Michael's been diagnosed with two rare diseases. The first one was your cancer. So what was that like, being diagnosed at first with your cancer? And what is the name of your cancer? The name of my cancer is hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. And at first, it didn't really mean much to me because I didn't really understand. I thought cancer was kind of just like cancer. And as I got more educated and ran into more cancer patients and ran into more online support groups and more people online, I realized that nobody had went through the exact same situation as me that I found online. I mean, a few people have been through my cancer that we've met online, but I haven't met anyone my age who's had my diagnosis and went through the same protocol I did. So having a rare disease is, it is a little lonely. It's weird because I don't have any friends that like had the same thing as me. And it's like, I can't be like, oh, that's my hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma buddy over there. But it is cool to have a rare disease in a way. It makes you feel a little unique, but it is a little bit of isolation from, you know, the rest of the world as well. That was, that was the follow-up to this. Um, first, did you kind of understand what rare meant? And I, I think, I don't know. It was at, not first. I did not really understand what rare. Yeah. Meant. I was just like, Oh, it's a rare cancer or it's a rare disease. Like, Oh, whatever. It's just a disease. I didn't really see the importance and how like much it actually affects research and treatment protocols and stuff right. for it being a rare disease. I didn't really see like, I guess you would say like the specifics behind everything and how complicated it really is. I kind of was just thinking to myself, oh, it's a rare disease. They're treating me for it, whatever. Did it make you feel special or did it make like special? Cause you, he is very special, but did it make you feel special or like alienated? That's my question. You know, it made me feel, it's a good, I think it was both, you know, there's times where I feel both. There's times where I'm like, yeah, I'm so rare. Nobody has my disease. (laughs) <laughs> and there's times when I'm like, no, this sucks. Like, I want a friend who has this exact thing as me. So it kind of goes both ways. For I, sure. I, I want to touch on a couple of things he said. One thing is, it's true. When he was diagnosed with this cancer, the first thing the doctors told us, some of you have heard us say this before, was not to Google it. And that was kind of like a red light. I'd never heard of it before. In fact, I carried around a piece of paper that said the name of the disease because I wanted to spell it correctly and know what it was. But we didn't Google it. When we did find out that there were less than 200 cases and a lot of those people didn't survive, it was kind of a weird feeling, Mm -hmm. to be honest. And like when Michael first put the name out there, because we've been on social media a lot, people would message me or they would message him and be like, oh my God, I know someone with this disease. And we'd get kind of excited to find someone. And I would say... Almost like a type of lymphoma. uh, Almost every time. It's a lymphoma I have. People would be like, oh my... My family member had lymphoma, so I'm I'm sure they understand what you're going through. But it's very different. Not to, not to say like lymphoma is yeah. Oh no, nothing, but, it's not nothing. Yeah. His dad had a form of lymphoma, but a very different one, a more common one. And then the other thing I wanted to say was that, um, I think once we realized it was such a, a low amount of people, then looking into what the protocols were, as Michael said. So the protocols for some of you, if you know cancer, for cancer treatments. Every cancer has a specific protocol that around the world, unless you're doing some kind of 
different treatment. You normally follow the same chemo protocols. And there wasn't one for his cancer. And in fact, we've met a couple of other people since then who have been diagnosed with his same disease, and none of them have followed the same protocol. No. No. So that is a little bit... Um, I guess it's unsettling, but it's so far it's worked. But then the thing was that after he did end up in remission from a bottle splenic T-cell lymphoma because of the bone marrow transplant, you wound up with another rare disease, but in a different way. Chronic, I think. chronic graft versus host disease. So yeah, I've had two rare diseases. And I think the difference, like a bottle splenic T-cell lymphoma, it's rare and less than 200 cases and finding research about this specific cancer, it's hard. And as a mom, I I understand. I'm not angry that there's not a lot of research about this cancer because think about, you know, the global community. But what has been really cool is with graft versus host disease, even though it is a rare a disease, there's rare... still a lot of people that we've seen that have chronic graft versus host disease way more than people with polysplenic. And we saw so much trauma. research. We see so much more research, yeah. even since you've been diagnosed. Yeah, and our friends at Lumanida think that maybe Michael, I don't know, that maybe he's tipped it at awareness. And I would not doubt that. I think we, hopefully that's the whole point is we right. can tip awareness towards that's it. That's the whole point. I think so. Do you think, um, so that's going to social media has social media helped you connect? Yes. Has social media, well, I'll let you answer yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you. social media has definitely helped me so much find other patients who have chronic graft versus host disease and even helped us find some people with hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. It's huge yes. to be on social media when we you're found talking three. about... We found three people yeah. and we are friends with them now. I mean, we've never met in person, but we're and friends with them virtually. So any rare disease that you have, <laughs> social media is a great place to go because... Those people are looking at their messages, probably yeah. trying to find other people that relate. So it's great to be on there and try to find and connect with people who have something similar to you. That's like a, it's like very interesting because I fit in with like the chronic graft versus host disease community, but then I don't fit in with like the cancer community before chronic graft versus host disease on social media. So social media helps a lot. Yeah, it definitely it, does. It does, but great I Great for connection. It is great for connection. I mean, because cancer is huge. I, I, I can't imagine that anyone listening to this has not been affected by cancer, but there there definitely is a difference when you're dealing with a rare one. Um, I think it's not only, though, that you've been through, okay, this is your second rare disease, but your age, you're, you're 22. And has that also affected you? And how does that make you feel as a 22-year-old you know, to be affected by two rare diseases. He is very special audience. I will tell you as his mom, he's a very special guy, but I don't know if this is a... Well, you know, I'm 22 with two rare diseases. Well, I've been, been through two rare diseases. I don't know if you say I have two rare diseases. I don't know how that works. I'm in remission from cancer, but I guess yes. it's still considered like there. I don't know. So my age with two rare diseases, it's weird. You know, a lot of people my age don't have health issues. Yeah. That's the big thing. So just having a rare disease, it's already another layer to it because initially people with a disease is already rare enough my age because 22, you're not supposed to have a disease that age. Come on. That's you're not supposed to have cancer but at 22, although we know what happens. No one should have cancer. No one. No, young duh, adults, of course. It's, it's different when you're a young adult too, yeah. you know, it is. having rare diseases at my age. This is the time when most people are figuring out their careers, they're in college, they're in school, they're kind of figuring out who they are. Yeah. And it's been very enlightening, of course, in a way. I had to enlighten myself. But, it, it's, but does it's it make been... you feel different? Because, okay, let's just be my quad mom here. I know you have your support group right. for cancer survivors. Does it make you feel a little bit different that your disease is different? And that you're also, a lot of people in your group, not all of them. And, and we talk about cancer and survivorship that it's like for life, like just because you're in remission, it's not over. But a lot of them are able to like go back to college and do things. Does that, because now you're facing this second hiccup or I want to say hiccup, not hiccup, this second challenge, whatever you want to call it. Like, does that make it frustrating for you, hard for you? It definitely makes it super hard for me. But there's nothing we can do except for like, 
you know, take it as it is. It's not fair to have a rare disease. No one asks for it, but you know, you're given things in life and you kind of just have to deal with it the best you can. And that's what we're doing. And a rare disease isn't always, I mean, it's not great, but it's not the worst thing, you know, sometimes it's cool. You get into communities like this and you meet other people and when you have a rare disease and you meet someone else with a rare disease, it makes you appreciate it so much more because it's so rare. So that's kind of the cool thing, which, you know, there's some positives, you know, you kind of feel special sometimes, even though <laughs> there's the downside, there's the upside. So, yeah. Do you think, I have an answer for this, but I want to ask this to you. Do you feel like because you've had two rare diseases, it has changed the way you've been treated in the medical community? I don't, I don't know. He has a different answer than me. My answer is yes. Okay. And I don't want to say different, like everyone else is not treated as well, but this is the part of having, okay, something rare. The really challenge in the, the, the true challenge in the beginning was finding the protocol for his diagnosis, but his doctor reached out to so many other doctors. There was a team of specialists looking for the best solution for you. And even though it was scary because it wasn't like, okay, this is the answer. It also, for me, it was so incredibly, I want to say beautiful to see how many people were on your team and like making efforts for you. And I, I saw the medical community like come you saw to... more of that because a caregiver i was more maybe, in the room maybe that's true and you were kind of more dealing with the doctors and stuff so for me i was kind of just like sitting there and i didn't see that as much but you were the one that's talking with dr d more than me that's true so it kind of makes sense but i do understand what you're saying when they when i first was diagnosed and they were coming in and checking up on me and trying to see what i had it was like very different yeah i i really think because he didn't have and i can also compare this you know my husband had a very Uh, more normal lymphoma and um, nothing against what and he passed away and that's just what happens sometimes but it was very much like this is what we do and it was very much by the book and with Michael it was like let's try to add this chemo let's try this medication and I know in a way that sounds kind of scary but in another way it was just it was so incredible and it also made me really believe in how doctors really do care because I felt like your medical community, they wanted the best for you. They were not looking for the most expensive treatment. They were not looking for, you know, they were looking to help find a cure for you, to heal you. And I thought that was beautiful. And I also think with graft versus host disease, it was a little bit different, but it was also a similar experience because where you were treated at the children's hospital, they're not as specialized in graft versus host disease because it doesn't happen so much with children. It happens more in adults. And they helped us to find an incredible doctor at an adult hospital with graft that specialized mm-hmm. in graft versus host. And I thought that was another very selfless, not trying to be like, well, I am God, you know the answer. So I feel like yeah. we've had a, a really great experience. Um, you just said selfless there. Speaking of selfless, he is <laughs> Ashley Kramer, the, the caregiver. What's it, so what's it like to care for someone with a rare disease? Because I'm sure sometimes caregivers can result to like something simple, like a support group of people who have the same disease and might do the same treatment. For you, when your kid has a symptom, me, it's like, and you don't know anyone else with that symptom because the disease is rare. Like, what's it like for you to navigate this whole thing as a caregiver? It has been scary definitely scary and in the beginning when we started this podcast i kind of mentioned that i know hepatosplenic t-cell lymphoma because since then i've looked it up and there is not a lot of research on a cure for this type of cancer and so part of me as a caregiver thinks wow that's not really fair that my kid got it but the other part of me is very smart and understands that you know, there's millions of people that get other cancers. Of course, the money is going to go there. I'm not upset about this at all. And again, what I just said about the doctors, they have gone above and beyond 
to do everything for you. So I feel very blessed in that way. Sometimes it is alienating. Sometimes I'd like to just like be like, wow, who else has been through exactly what Michael has been through? So I know that they're okay. And actually the very first person that we kind of met that had been through this, they passed away. And so that was a little bit scary. And then we know people with graft versus host disease that have passed away. But now we've also met people that are living with it. And, you know, Michael is very special and we are very, you know, we have taken this and we have said there is no why. And I think that works very well with a rare disease because with this disease, there is no why. We have no idea why this happened. They don't always know why graft versus host disease also happens after transplant. For some people, it's very strong. Some people, not at all. Some people, a little bit. Um, but I think that we have taken this and said there's no why, but there is a purpose. And I think turning that around has certainly helped. And I think you're a rare guy. And if anyone is going to take on two rare diseases and make something beautiful come out of it, it is my son. And I think that Thank is you. huge. And the fact that he does hashtag GVHD on his Instagram posts, I think that's brought awareness from the medical community, if I'm honest, from a lot of people that are searching for support. So I think that's huge. The fact that you have been brave enough and he's also, you're so open about talking about it. And sometimes with rare diseases, it's a little hard to talk about because you're like, oh, no one is going to relate to this. But I think you've been wonderful about communicating. Thank and I you. think that is our, our last question that Lumanity asked us to touch on is, Michael Kramer, mm -hmm. what would be your top recommendations for people who receive a new diagnosis of a rare condition? And they ask the same of me, but I would love to get your answer. Communicate really clearly with your doctors and try to do your best to make sure that they know what they're dealing with. And if they don't know what they're dealing with and they're not specialized in this, try to go somewhere else because my doctor specializes in chronic graft versus host disease. And that has definitely helped me a lot because he knows so much about my disease, not to criticize the people at the children's hospital, but they weren't experts on chronic GVHD. So they sent us over to an adult hospital where a doctor was just specifically had studied GVHD and chronic GVHD. And that has helped so much. And just build, try to build a community too. If you can find people online with your rare disease as well, yeah, definitely go and find like a community online of people that have been through something similar to you, even if they don't have the same exact experience. It will definitely help you mentally too. But also, what would you say for caregivers? You know, one thing I want to touch on this is that the benefit of a rare disease is that sometimes you don't really know the outcome. And sometimes that's a good thing because I think then you don't pigeonhole yourself into, okay, this is going to result in this. I think for us, it's been more like, hey, let's just go for it. And I think that that's been kind of a benefit of a rare disease is not having something in your mind that you're already fixated on. You can hear some knocking outside. I think they're doing some construction outside. Hopefully that's not a big issue. We're going to keep going though. Um, but I think also, yeah, what Michael said, connection, speaking out. I think for me, having connection has been a huge part of this. Uh, we've been very blessed to have the people that, at Lumanity that have understood and, you know, calling attention to it. It's rare disease day. Let's yeah, advocate for yourself Advocating. as well. Something that helped me too is like posting about it on social media, yeah. sharing it with people, kind of showing people that you can get through it too and helping others has been huge for me. And I love what Michael said before. Also, don't be afraid to ask for a specialist. Yeah, don't be afraid because, to change your team and yes. be like, hey, like, I'd prefer to go here. It's, it's yes. very important to advocate for yourself when you have something very rare. You want the best of the best. You do. And yeah, if you have to go to a different hospital, different doctors, do it. Because yeah. you want the best for your loved one. And I think that that yeah. is... Yeah, we love you guys. I think that's it. We love you guys. Yeah. If you're dealing with a rare disease, then, reach out. Yeah, get have, in the community. We find have support, support. We have support groups too, so... We do. We're here for you guys. And yeah. from one rare disease person to a rare disease A rare caregiver. disease caregiver. <laughs> and then to you guys who are amazing and rare yourselves in a way because you're so amazing. And everyone is and everyone. rare. 
love everyone you is special we love you so much and thank you for listening to this episode of michael and mom talk rare disease cancer podcast and think about that february 29th rare disease day 2024 oh yeah all our love you